how you might use it to, to start to capture your own family history. So, um, uh, just a quick bit about myself, as Ileana said, my background is in anthropology and archaeology, and, and I had worked for a number of years as an archaeologist on the, on the El Dorado and the Stanislaw National Forest. Um, I'm also uh, just an avid collector of all kinds of things. I've always been fascinated with sort of ethnographic art my whole life, and it was kind of, and it was really the need to, to catalog my own things that evolved into the, the product that's now catalog it. Um, it's a product we launched a couple of years ago um, with the idea that we're going to sell it primarily to the private collector world. But um, uh, as we, we grew and grew, we realized what a real need there was in the, in the museum world, particularly a small museum world. Um, and right now we've expanded really quite dramatically in that, uh, in that avenue as well. So now we've got um, uh, museums and institutions using us all across the United States and Canada and um, uh, multiple countries around the world, private collectors, uh, organizations and museums are, are now using catalog it so uh, I'm proud to show you what it is and how it works and how you might be able to use it um, one thing to keep in mind for free is that uh, to keep in mind as I'm talking here is that catalog it is uh, free for up to 100 entries so you can actually use it it's fully functional for up to 100 entries so um, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to give it a shot there take take a look so I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, hop into the, to my presentation Okay, we'll give it just a moment here. All right, so <laughs> this first screen I'm, show, I'm showing you here to start out with is just something to kind of keep in mind. This is a picture I took, oh gosh, a few years ago at, a, uh, at an antique mall. And you know, I'm an, I'm an avid collector, like I said, and so uh, if any of you are also collectors out there, you know, you, you see a place like this and you just want to get in there and start looking around and seeing what's there. But, um, but one of the things to think about when you look at something like this is, gosh, look at all these, neat old things. I mean, some of these things, are, there's old items in here and they've got stories behind them. What, what were those stories? You know, somebody had, uh, had you know, this might have been a, some cherished item in a family for years and years and years. And now somehow that story is disconnected. It's, it's, it's lost its, its, um, it's, lost its, its, um, its provenance, really. And now here it is with a little red sticker on it in the, in the antique mall for sale. So it's really capturing the stories of those things and trying to keep the story together with those things because that, um, that, that's, uh, that's what makes those things valuable to us. So real quick, I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about collecting and, or cataloging. Why, why would you bother to catalog your things? So there's a, several reasons. I mean, the one that you probably know the most would be your insurance purposes. Um, you know, these things have value. You wanna make sure that for insurance purposes, you can at least be able to provide a quick report to your insurance company um, in case anything ever happens to those items. Um, the intrinsic value of the item, you know, like I said, some of these things, they're not terribly valuable at the antique mall, but the story that's behind them makes them really valuable. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit deeper here, but that intrinsic value is a, is a, a major reason to catalog those things. I can also increase the monetary value of something. I mean, let's say you have an, an old brick, you know, it's just an old brick. It looks, you know, it looks like an old brick you'd find out in your yard, but if, let's say that brick, you know, actually came from the original White House that burned down and in the War of 1812, you know, the British burned it to the ground. Well, if you could show that that brick is from that White House, all of a sudden that old brick is valuable. It has real uh, monetary value as well. Uh, cataloging also helps you know kind of what you've got. You know, you can uh, look across your collection, see what you might have too much of or too little of, or things you'd want to, um, you know, maybe um, uh, expand on. So it allows you to really look across all your collection to see what's, what's there. Um, it can help you preserve the integrity of the item. I, I know I'll switch off of this, the screen here and give you something more interesting to look at in a minute. Uh, but the, the physical integrity of the item, you know, being able to share a digital copy of a photograph, for instance, is, uh, is so much better than sharing that actual copy of that photograph. Those, they're, they're, um, they're delicate. You don't want to have too many fingers touching something like that. So, be, so being able to share uh, a picture of a, of, a, of a glass, you know, something that's glass is fragile, um, can help you really preserve that item. Um, and lastly, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, cataloging can really be a lot of fun. I, I don't know how many times I've found, as I'm going through looking really carefully at the items in my collection, I'm finding out new and interesting little things about those, uh, those items in the collection. So uh, it's really, to me, it's really a lot of fun. So I'm gonna hop off this screen and I'm gonna go over to catalog it. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little, just a little bit about this, uh, this product we developed to catalog it. So what does it look like? So, this is what it looks like when you log in. You'd come to a screen here that's called All Entries, and it's just all your stuff. It's all there, it's all together. You can scroll through it. Um, you can search across it. Uh, it's really handy to be able to search across. Uh, for instance, search works a lot like an internet search. It helps you find what, you know, anything at all you might be looking for. 
let's say you're looking for everything from that relates to Sheboygan. Sheboygan. Here I go. I've got a whole bunch of postcards that are either sent to or from Sheboygan or they're scenes of Sheboygan. Here's a basket that I actually bought in Sheboygan. So the, the search can be really handy. It works a lot like an internet search. You can search with a, uh, a string of words and quotes or words with a plus symbol and helps you find, uh, it'll find any of those entries that either have that exact string or with the plus symbol or entries that include um, uh, those, those words, but not necessarily together. And what you're seeing here in this thumbnail view is a, a picture of the item that you, uh, that you included, the name you've given it, what you've cataloged it as, and we'll get into that a little bit deeper here. And if you're using some kind of a numbering system for your items, the number would show here as well. Um, from this side over here, this is the all, uh, next to all entries is this, these three bars, we call it the main menu or the hamburger menu here. And when you click on that, you can see other things that you can, that you've got here. So all entries is a folder that you'll always have that includes all your stuff. And you can see I've created a whole bunch of other folders here with all different kinds of, you know, based on what's, you know, types of things generally. Um, folders can be really handy ways to organize your stuff. And you can have things, the same item can live in as many folders as it makes sense for you to live in. So actually, while we're looking at this here, I'm going to, um, I'm going to create a new folder. Uh, I'm going to call it mom, because that's what we're going to work on today a little bit. I've got some, my mother passed away recently, and we're starting to really uh, catalog and document some of the things that were important to her and, and have become important to us. So I'm just going to create a folder called mom. If I could add a description of it in here if I wanted to. That little blue box in the corner in the bottom, you may have noticed that had the count. Um, I can either show that or hide it and include values. I'm, I'm not going to need it to show any of that for right now. So I'm going to create this empty folder called mom. And we'll get back to this here in just a moment. Um, from this side here, there's a couple other things that are worth pointing out. Um, down here in your settings, you'll see that you can add collaborators. And I would really encourage you to add collaborators to a collection to, as you start to document a collection such as this. Uh, you don't want to have just one person have access to all that stuff. You know, if it's you, something happens to you, it's that now that's gone. You know, who's going to continue? Who's going to who's going to have access to all that information? I've actually given access uh, uh, to my collection to a, a couple of other people because I want to make sure that if anything ever happens to me, all the information that I put in here, which is pretty extensive at this point, is not uh, it's not gone if something were to happen to me. So let's go back down here. Let's look at one of these folders real quick. Let's take a look at the, uh, just for fun, let's look at the dolls folder. Uh, so you can see I've collected all different kinds of ethnographic dolls, Alaskan dolls and uh, native Iroquois uh, corn husk dolls. These are my uh, dolls from here in Northern California. These are Route 66, old, actually quite old uh, tourist dolls that are sort of, what you might call a fake kachina, but they're actually kind of old and neat, uh, neat dolls. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a look at what you could do with, with this side here. So up here on this side, the things that I can do with this folder of items, my group of items here, I can, uh, I can edit it, I can change the name of it, I can change my little description that I've got of it, I can change the sort order by either it's you know, alphabetically ascending or descending, or if I'm using numbering, I can, uh, I can uh, sort them by numerical. Um, another kind of a neat feature from this side here are the print functions, and there are several print functions, but pages is really kind of a fun one here. And this is a neat way to, if you want to share, if you want to actually print things out and share or print them and email them to share with somebody. So the print function defaults to just showing the primary photo. And this, we're in a folder right now, so there's a number of items in here. Um, you can do the same thing from any individual entry. Um, I can include the primary photo. I can include all the photos that are there. Um, I'm going to go back to just include the primary photo. Um, I can click all, and now I've got every other piece of information that's included anywhere in here, and I can attach that as well. So. If um, somebody was really interested in these dolls, I could create this. I can now print it to my um, uh, print it as a PDF and email it off to them. So it's an easy way to create kind of a neat uh, a neat way of sharing those those items. Now another neat way to share is uh, on the internet. If you notice, a number of my folders here have a little globe inside of them, and with a catalog and subscription, it's actually uh, you can share your collection out to the world as well. And I'll show you what that looks like and why you might want to do that here uh, as we get a little further down here. So let's go back here into my all entries and um, we'll take a look at one of these items in here. So I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. Let's take a look at this postcard, a Mary Yuletide. This is a, a kind of a nice example here. So this is, this is a good example of something that has very little monetary value. It's just a, it's an old postcard. I mean, it's from, you know, 1917. Uh, it's not in very good shape. The picture itself is not a particularly, you know, 
captivating image. It's kind of cute, but this at the antique mall, this might be a you know 50 cent or 75 cent postcard. But when you start to look at some of the details here, uh, it starts to get really kind of interesting. So this po this uh, postcard is postmarked December 27th, 22nd, 1917. Um, and those of you that remember your your uh, your history, you know that the United States had um, had uh, entered World War One uh, earlier in 1917, April 1917, and actually a few weeks before this, um, we declared war on the Austro-Hungarian Empire as well. So the United States was really gearing itself up to go uh, full on into World World War One. And as you look a little further here, you see that this. Um, uh, this postcard was sent to this gentleman, Frank Trimberger, um, and he was at the company via the 310th Engineers in Camp Custer, Michigan. Uh, so he was getting ready. He was probably um, uh, getting ready to go off into the, you know, he'd been in the Army, he's getting ready to go off to war. And here's the message, you know, dear brother Frank, we're sorry to hear that you could not be home for Xmas, but we hope we can see you on the 26th. And it ends here with love from your sister, Lucy. So it's kind of a cute message, and that makes the postcard a little bit more valuable. But to me, this postcard is really valuable. This Frank Philip Trimberger is actually my grandfather. And Lucy Dorothea is, of course, my great aunt Lucy. Um, I, I didn't point out here, but you can attach multiple images to a catalog of records. So I, I could have as many images I, as I wanted here. And having these images is, is really uh, handy. And um, I can, even when I'm holding this postcard, I can read it fairly well. But if I click on it here, take a picture of it, and even double click, I can zoom way in and it makes it a lot easier to, to transcribe something when you can zoom in like this. Dear Brother Frank, we're all sorry to hear that you could not be home for Xmas. So anyway, it's a, a, another handy little thing there. Now, as you're looking at the entry here, you also see that there's a lot of these little tags on things. And those are what we call, in catalog, those are called uh, profile fields. And they're ways that you can relate things to each other. So this is a neat way that you can start to create connections between the people in your family and, and the places that, uh, that, that are important in your family history. Um, I can click on any one of these and see anything else I have that relates to whatever that, um, that piece of, uh, of information is. Like up here, the, this particular postcard publisher, National Ar I can look at all my other postcards from National Archive. But where it's really important is, is the people. So I'm going to click on uh, Frank Philip Trimberger here. And it actually brings up the record that I've created for him. I'm getting kind of a little snapshot view into here. I can see when he was born and where he was born and, and uh, where he lived and where he died. Um, here's all the other people that I know that he's related to. In fact, all the rest of his family is here. And I've got a couple of pictures even in here of him. You can see I've also got a live Wikipedia link. Now this is really neat here. My grandfather was uh, part of a group of soldiers that was on their way to France in World War I. And once they got to England, they were diverted and actually sent to Russia to intervene in the, uh, in the uh, Russian Civil War uh, when the, the communists took over in Russia. So here's actually a picture of my grandfather wearing what's called the polar bear insignia here. And I can click on this, it's a live link. It'll open up in a separate tab, this Wikipedia page for this uh, expeditionary force to Northern Russia. Uh, it's a really neat way to connect, um, you know, this outside world history into your, you know, into your, your immediate family history. Um, close this tab now, and we'll go back over here for a second. Uh, I also see that Frank Philip Trimberger is tied to 23 things in my collection so far. So I can click on this, and it flips over, and I can see everything else that has some kind of relation to to Frank Philip Trimberger here. And I can, you know, scroll down, look at them. It looks like there's a number of other postcards. There's other people that are mentioned in my system that he has a connection to. And I can navigate directly to any of these as well. So let's look at this one here. This is just a couple of years later. This is in December of 1920. So he'd really just gotten back from Russia. Um, uh, and when he got married to, to my grandmother here. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what, a, what, what's, what an entry looks like in Catalog and the kinds of relationships that you can have within the entry. So let's go back here to my all, all entries. It's going to zoom me back. It's going to put me where I just was uh, within the middle of all my collection into the, uh, the item we were just looking at there. But down here in the corner is where you can create an entry. Now I'm going to click the plus here and it's going to give me some options. I can, I'm on my computer as I'm giving this demonstration here, but I can attach a photo out of my photo files. Um, I can attach a PDF or an Excel document if I have on a Word document. I can create an entry without any media. But what's um, really kind of handy about a program like Catalog is you can also use your phone or your tablet to create the entry. So Catalog, it has, you can download the app for free from the App Store or Google Play and actually take a picture through the app um, to, to, to catalog your things. You can take a picture um, to create a new entry or to um, add to an existing entry. 
I'm actually going to click on this photo thing here, and I'm going to find the uh, photo of the item I want to catalog and bring it up here. Okay, so this is what I wanted to work on today. This is actually just a little blue glass hand painted jar um, with a kind of a uh, silver plate uh, top on it here. Um, the first thing I have to do is give it a name. Catalog it entries, it requires you to give it some kind of a name. So this is actually a Blue, gla blue glass of cracker jar. And here I actually have the ability to kind of manipulate it. I can pull it up and down and move it the way it's gonna uh, appear within my thumbnail screen. So I want this kind of high up here. If I needed to, I could rotate the image. You know, if you've taken pictures with your cell phone, it often insists that they're either um, uh, portrait or landscape and it's the opposite of what you want. So you can rotate it. If I needed to crop it, I could do that here. I can move these crop bars around or I can pull them in or out if I needed to. I had too much extra white space around there. It's actually in pretty good shape, so I don't need to crop it. Um, but I'm gonna move it up and hold it just like this for my thumbnail image. So with catalog, the next thing it's gonna ask you to do is say, okay, what, what kind of an item is this? What, what sort of a classification would you like to use to document your item? So I'm gonna click next. Um, and it's gonna show uh, within the folder I'm in, recommended is actually, it, it's the, um, uh, all the classifications you've got, you've currently used in your, um, in that current um, uh, folder. Uh, and it starts with whatever you've most recently used. Now, there's a few that are kind of overarching that you're going to use regularly. Object artifact is really useful for any kind of item that was made for use or model represented use. So in other words, if it was a toy or something like that, you'd use object artifact. We also have uh, kind of over, overarching ones for photograph, uh, archive, um, artworks. Uh, but things like object artifact are going to be really handy. And you can see when I click on it, it even opens up and, and adds, there's some uh, additional ones underneath there. But you can stop at the level of object artifact and it'll bring in the fields you're going to need to catalog something like a little blue glass cracker jar here. Um, so now I can go ahead and start to catalog it. Well, first of all, if I had additional photos, I can click and drag them in here uh, so I can document this in, in all different kinds of ways here. But um, What's important now is to start to describe what it is and what it was used for. So this, you know, here's what I just described. It's this blue cracker jar, uh, hand painted. It's, uh, it's got this lid. It's got a you know, curved handle up here on top. I can go into as much detail as I like there. What was it used for? Um, we've got field to document it in, in it's really as great of detail as you'd like. Now, you don't need to, to document it anywhere near this kind of detail um, if you don't have the information. Um, at the very least, I'd recommend you start off with something like just this, a, a photograph and a name. I mean, that, at least then it's there, it's, you've started. Um, like I said, you can use your phone or your tablet and you can find yourself, I, I find myself honestly using that, uh, my, my phone to, to add to my records all the time. Um, I've been literally sitting at the office at the dentist waiting and open up my phone and can make edits <laughs> and add information to my collection. Um, Made or created again. You could document the, the you know, the the, uh, the creation of this particular item here. Who's the artist? If I knew when it when it was made, who made it? When it was made? This is made approximately uh, 1885. I'm going to say circa. I don't know for sure, and I don't know that if it was made over a date range. And I knew the range. I can include the range. I can attach time period. So I'm not going to go into all these fields here, cataloging it. But I'm going to talk about some of the things that are particularly important for um, for family history, particularly. So relationships is where I'm going to go down here. Um, now this jar is, once again, this is another example of an item that, you know, at the, um, at the antique mall might be a 30 or $40 item. It's not a particularly valuable item. But that, crack, that little cracker jar was actually given uh, by my great-grandmother to my grandmother. And my great-grandmother likely got it at her wedding, but we don't know that for certain. Uh, but her name was Margar, excuse me, Margarita Roth Trimberger. So I'm going to attach her as a related person. Um, and I'm going to note here that first owned this the jar. Um, I'm now going to attach uh, Margarita gave this to my grandmother for their wedding. So at that wedding picture, we know that that's it was probably shortly thereafter that, that she received this jar that my grandmother had probably got, my great grandmother had probably received for her wedding. So I'm going to attach it to, to Lida and Stell, her, her now daughter-in-law that she gave that jar to. Um, Julita Ann gave it to my mother. Well, my mother inherited it after Julita Ann passed away. So that's my mother is Constance. Constance Mary Trimmer-Garayle. So now I've got this, you know, multi-generations that all have ties to this. 
and I can describe here in, in detail what this, you know, what this, uh, what these relationships mean. But now I've got that jar connected to all these people. Um, I know that for most of its life, most of the it's hundred and what is that now, hundred and uh, thirty-five years or so of life, um, most of that time it was in Sheboygan. That's probably where it was originally acquired. So I'm tying it also to Sheboygan. It's related to Sheboygan, and I can describe in here that it was in my great grandmother's and my grandparents' house for almost all of its 135 years of life. If it was tied to a particular event, I could tie that here. So I know that it was a wedding present um, to my grandparents. So I'm related to their wedding. If you see here, I've created a couple of weddings in advance, a couple of, excuse me, um, events in advance. I'm gonna tie it to that wedding as well. Um, and I could tie it to all kinds of other things. Here's where I could attach web links. Maybe I eventually will find a good website that describes that type of, of glassware and, and its manufacturer. I could attach that here to use for um, or additional research or just as, as, a, as a reference point. Uh, but now I'm just gonna go ahead and click say, oh, actually no, I wanna do some other things here. I, we created that uh, mom folder here. So here when I click on this folders up here at the top, I'm gonna scroll back up here just so we can see the image again here. When I click on folders here, um, I've got available to me all those folders that I've, that I've previously created. So I'm gonna attach this to my mom folder. I can put it in other folders if I wanted to, if, it, if I thought that it belonged in any of these other ones as well, I could, I could include it in there as well. So now I've got this in my mom folder. Uh, I've also got the ability to attach tags. Now tags are kind of like, uh, you can think of it as putting a, um, a post-it note on your entry. And so there's a few that I use regularly. You can see that, well, not, they're, they're not in there right now. There's a few that I use uh, generally, a few things like, you know, add additional photos. Um, I've actually created one that says, ask Uncle Bob, because I still have an Uncle Bob around that, uh, that actually is a great source of information. So I could ask him for additional details. If he remembers anything else specific about this, where did it sit in the house, that kind of a thing. Um, I could attach those tags to that as well. But I'm going to click save for now. And we can go ahead and now here it's, it's appearing here in my um, in my all entries. I'm going to click on it and we can see what we've added in there. So I didn't put in too much information here, but I did create these all these relationships. And now I can click on any one of these and um, and see what else ties to those things. This wedding of Frank and Juliet, uh, I've only just begun to add things to. Here's my uh, description of the event, December 29th, 1920. And I've got that wedding photograph and the jar both tied to that uh, wedding event. Uh, so now this little jar that if it was at the antique mall would be just a, you know, kind of a cute knickknack, um, has real value and real, uh, a real connection back to our family. Uh, to edit the entry, let's say I'm ready. I'm going to add some more information. I've talked to Uncle Bob and I have some more information. I'm just going to click my little edit pencil. And now all the fields again are open up for me to edit. I can type to include more of a description there. I can include, you know, its use. Um, I can tie more information. If I knew more information about the family history, I can include that as well. If maybe if I knew what great grandma kept in this jar, you know, it's a cracker jar, but did she keep crackers in there? Maybe she kept candy. Maybe it was never to be touched. Um, I can include all those little uh, bits of family history to the extent I've got it. So if I have any other information, I just click that edit pencil and, and uh, it's available to, um, uh, to edit. Uh, in fact, something like uh, ask Dr. Excuse me, ask Uncle Bob. That's something I would highly recommend you absolutely do. Talk to your family. I mean, this is something you've probably heard and probably something you should, you know, you should do, <laughs> but collect those little bits and pieces of family stories. Um, as I mentioned, something like catalog it, you can use your phone to add it, create, uh, to create uh, uh, entries. So if you were to, if you still have your parents or your grandparents around, why like, take your phone, walk, walk with them through the house, look at the things, ask them to tell you about things that are important to them that are in the house, snap a picture, make a few notes on your phone right there as you're going along, um, because those stories are, are, are invaluable and you'll, you'll lose them if you're not, um, if you're not vigilant about it. Uh, so capture those family stories. It's, um, it's, uh, it's really imperative to, to, uh, to your history. So now let's go back and uh, talk a little bit about why you might want to share something like this with, with the on the internet. So I'm going to look, first of all, I'm going to hop over out of my catalog at account here and I'm going to hop over into uh, the catalog at hub. So the catalog at hub is, is a, a, it's a quick and easy way to publish things to the internet. Um, um, and it's included with a subscription. So you, you do need to subscribe to catalog in order to use the catalog at hub. Uh, but you can also, a, a regular, just even a free account in catalog, it includes up to three users. So I would, want, again, recommend that you allow somebody else access to your account so that if something happens to you, it's accessible. 
but that's also a nice way to share. You could create a, a, an email account that you could share with your sister or your, you know, your children that they can actually log in and look at the things that you've, uh, that you've added into there. So I'm actually publishing this collection anonymously, I'll, I'll, a, a number of things out of my own collection, just as anonymous. And I'm just saying that I'm in the Western US. Now you can, be, you can include your full name here if you want to. You can include your full address if you want to. If you've got a website, you can actually even attach your, a link to your website here. And the idea would be that you'd link from your own website to, out to here to say, you know, look at my collection of X, you know. But everything, every single, every individual entry uh, has a, a unique URL here, and these are public URLs now. Um, uh, and every entry that you create also has a unique URL. So you can link to any particular entry. You can email a link to your brother-in-law and say, you know, take a look at this great X that I just, you know, discovered. Um, but for something like sharing those family things, to be able to, to create a folder and share those things, it's uh, it's uh, it's a really neat way to do that. So let's. This is what I'm. This is what my cataloged account looks like. Um, I'm just going to open up. Let's open up this uh, art pottery, for instance. You can see this art pottery folder. You can kind of see that I'm a little bit of a fan of, of Roseville pottery. I collected a few pieces over the years, not too many. Uh, so that's what a folder looks like. But let's go back into catalog it. I'm actually going to go over here into my folders. And again, you can see the ones with the little globe are the ones that I'm currently publishing out to the internet. I'm going to click on my mom folder here, which so far just has this cracker jar in it. You know what? Let's add that, uh, that photograph too. I'm going to go back to my all entries and I'm going to search for that. I'm just going to search for wedding. And there's the photograph. I'm going to click my edit pencil and I'm going to add that folder into my mom folder. There we go. So now that photograph and the jar are both in that folder. Click save. And now we'll go back to that folder. Mom. Okay. Now I'm going to come up here to my actions menu here and I'm going to go down and I'm going to just click publish folder. Now, if you notice, it's got a check mark. Now it's being published out to the internet. I'm going to go back to my catalog at hub. Again, this is now I popped out of my private account and out into what the world can see. I'll refresh my screen here. And if I scroll down uh, below all my other folders, here's my mom folder. It's published, now available for, uh, for the world to see. I could send a link of this folder to my cousins and they could start to look at the things that I'm cataloging for mom, maybe, maybe to my brothers and sister. But here's that wedding photograph, for instance, with its description and the details. Uh, so that's a, a really neat way you can share your collection, share your family history with your, um, with your siblings, with your uh, the rest of your family. Uh, you can also put things out there that you don't know much about, for instance, and, and say, you know, send it out to the family, send a link out, send out this link uh, and say, hey, does anyone know anything else about, you know, this, this, and this, or any of these things, you know, these were in a box of mom's photos. Does anyone know who these people are? Uh, it's a great way to start to, to, to share your, uh, your things with your, um, with your family. So, We'll go back to catalog it here, but that is kind of a nice, uh, I hope a nice overview of, of how catalog it works uh, and how you might be able to use something like catalog it. Uh, even if you don't subscribe to some, excuse me there, I'm out of my, uh, out of my collection there. Let me get back to my, <laughs> my own collection, my all entries here. Even if you're not um, going to use a program like, like catalog it, I would just highly encourage you to, to capture those stories. Use your cell phone, you know, take a picture. Um, and use the notes feature in your cell phone and write down notes. Talk to those, talk to the people that still remember what those things are. Um, uh, keep track of those things. Uh, share them with your family so that you're not the only one that's holding on to that kind of information because uh, someday it, it will otherwise just be lost. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Ileana. Do you have any questions out there waiting for me? I'm happy to take them now. I won't take up the full hour. Hopefully you haven't all finished your cocktails by now, but, <laughs> but otherwise you'll have time for a second one. Yeah, well, thank you so much for showing us around catalog it, Dan. That was really sure. um, awesome to see that kind of view of it different from how we use it in our museums. That was really fun. Um, we had a question from Nicole in the chat. Um, she mm -hmm. would like to know if you um, assign an object to a folder, can it exist in multiple folders? So you know how you um, you moved items between folders just now. Like, will it still exist sure. in the original folder that you had it in? It certainly will. Yeah. That well, for instance, that uh, that wedding photograph that I put in mom, you know, that's this jar and this wedding photograph are all still both in all entries. So they're both still here. In fact, I can search now for you know for that wedding. 
and it's still here. So this, you can have this in multiple folders. You might have a folder of all your photographs, and this could be in the photograph folder and in the mom folder and in all, all entries. So all entries is always everything, but um, it's sometimes it's very handy to have things in multiple folders, so certainly. Any other questions? Yes, um, Kristen would like to know, is there a way to include video or do you just have the ability to link to something like a YouTube or Vimeo? Uh, sure. Well, the, the linking is a, is a kind of a neat way to do that because that's an easy way to share with the world right now. A catalog, it actually we've, we've incorporated the, the technology to attach audio and video files to records. Um, but until we've developed the ability to actually play back from within the record, we haven't released that, uh, that widely. So um, the, the, that's coming very, very soon. Right now, it, like I said, you can upload and store audio and video files in your records. Uh, you can't play them back from within the program yet, though. But you'd be able to click on it and download it and play it to any device that you're at. So that's coming. Awesome, I'm uh, excited for that. <laughs> it's um, kind of, actually, one of our users is a, um, uh, a lar has a large film archive. They're down here in, in, the, south, in the San Jose area. Uh, it's an institution that has a, a lot of films, and they've actually published a ton of them on YouTube, and it's actually really neat. You can, they can go through their entries um, and just click on the YouTube link, and it, it, the YouTube video will play beside the entry there. So that, that, that's actually kind of a neat way to do that. Uh, video, I mean, you know, video storage is one thing. We don't catalog it. We don't charge at all by the amount of storage you're using currently. However, once we've implemented video, we may need to start to do that because um, video files take up a tremendous amount of, of storage space. Audio files and even large, large images don't take up anything near what video files will. But yeah, so that's something that's going to be really neat. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to see that. Um, Adrienne would like to know: Is there a way to back up all of your catalog entries offline? Well, you can always. There's a, a off this. I didn't mention that here. From this uh, um, uh, actions menu here, you have the ability to export, and you can create exports of your of your full account anytime you want to. You can currently export them in a, in a JSON or CSV format. Uh, and we're going to be expanding that to include XML and HTML so that it's an easy way to include all your images, all your information, all at once. So uh, that's one way you can always back up your information. I mean, we actually, you know, it lives in the cloud. It actually lives, we, we use Amazon Web Services to store all this stuff. Um, and we back it up everything every night completely. And we store the backups for 14 days. So there's, uh, there actually is always a solid backup of everything. Great. Um, we do have a question here. Is Cameron Stanford House cataloging their collections using Catalog It? We are. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Dan can just very quickly show us some of the museums and other galleries that are that do have public um, sure. collections on the hub. I can say it's been really um, kind of life changing for me working at the Cameron Stanford House to be able to use a tool like this to work uh -huh. start working on our collection in this way. So. That's a great question. Thanks for thanks for mentioning that. Let me go back here to the hub. So I'm still in my own uh, uh, shared hub account here, this anonymous account. But if I go back here, we get to the kind of the main page, which we have a few highlighted. The Cameron Stanford House is one of the highlighted uh, accounts here. But if I click on all collections, I can start to see everyone else that's sharing to the hub. So here's here's me. The cataloged collections is another test account, but that's for an organization type account. Anytime Museum is our uh, museum display account. But you can see here's a, a a uh, collection of uh, primarily Cuban uh, art that's being shared. The Cohen Bray House is another historic house right nearby us here in the in the San Francisco Bay Area. Exhibit Envoy is a company that uh, that creates uh, really neat traveling exhibits. All their things are shared on here. Um, there are several Art with Elders is another large organization here in the Bay Area that's using it. Uh, the Mary Porter Cessna Art Gallery at UC Santa Cruz. Let's scroll down here, and uh, there's Cameron Stanford, and um, just open up uh, one of these just to take a look here. Um, and there's a few uh, really fun ones in here. Um, Heritage Acres is up in um, British Columbia, Virgin Valley, and down in uh, Mesquite, Arizona. The Basque Museum and Cultural Center is really kind of a neat one. They've got a nice site they've created here. Um, they're sharing a number of folders there and lots of unique information about the uh, Basque culture here in the United States. I'll go back here. Um, another one that I was going to point out is, um, gosh, there's every time I look at this list, it's it's growing. Uh, the National Museum of the Surface Navy at the Battleship Iowa, uh, a new one here, Ice House Museum in Texas. But uh, the Vermont Historical Society has got some neat uh, things that they're sharing. Uh, Vermont's Women's History Database is really kind of neat. So you can click on something like this and 
and go through all this uh, neat history of, of women in Vermont. I, I was really amazed to see this and just, that was really kind of a neat and unique way to use the, the hub. Um, and I'll go back here and let's go back and let's take a look also at Cameron Stanford, of course, our hosts for today. Uh, they, they're sharing actually a number of items out of their collection in here. Um, uh, very room front parlor, for instance, you can see the things that are in the parlor. Now that you can't, at this moment, get into the house, you can actually see some of the things that are within the house there. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the hub is, a, is, is, is really growing in use uh, almost, almost exponentially. It's getting a lot, a lot of use. Yeah, it's been really fun for us to think of uh, new ways that we can use the hub moving in the future. So that's a really cool feature to have. Um, a couple more questions. Let's see, is sure. catalog, I think we have a lot of um, fellow museum professionals joining us tonight. So I'm sorry for those of you who are you know, more interested in the family history, but we do have some uh, kind of more technical questions for you, Dan. Uh, sure. Is catalog is able to generate reports? Sure, so let's go back and I'll open up one of these folders real quick. I won't take up too much time here, but let's go to one of these kind of a smaller folder. Um, let's go to this one. This is just kind of a fun one here. This might be more museum-y types of things in here, but from this side here where I showed this uh, actions menu here, uh, the, the print functions that one print pages, it is, in fact, it is a report. It's kind of like uh, creating a quick sort of a PDF report, but you can include any of the information that you've used in the entry in those reports quickly and easily. Uh, you can also extract uh, information in a tabular form by clicking table here. Um, this lays out this information is not the pretty layout like the other print was, but this gives you the option here to download this directly to Excel or to CSV that you can open in numbers or Google Sheets or anything else you might be using. Uh, and it's also kind of neat in that, you know, it defaults to some basic information, but you can click all and now every other field that's anywhere in use, anywhere within either the entry of the folder is available for you to add to your, uh, to your uh, uh, report here. So I can add my ethnographic information and I can add, for instance, um, I mentioned that this has catalog, it came out of the basket world. So there's a lot of uh, uh, basket details in catalog. It. So I'm gonna click this, but now my reports become kind of unwieldy. I've just added this many columns into my report. You see here now my column is my, my report, my Excel sheet would be two feet long, but I have the ability to condense all these by using these little slider buttons here. So I can condense all these fields down um, just by clicking the, uh, I click start, I, I meant to click up here, the um, coiled basket details. There we go. So now, for instance, when we get to a coiled basket entry, all these things are condensed into one uh, column instead of spread out amongst the multiple. So it's, this is a really easy way to extract information for any purpose you might want. So uh, there are a couple of, of, of those. There is also, um, what we call one-click reports here. Insurance report, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the, one of the reasons you may want to catalog is for insurance purposes. Um, this is just a one-click report that you can either use to provide to your insurance company if you want to, to give them a list of what you've got, or maybe even to make a claim. Maybe the, the, you know, the room was severely damaged and you want to be able to send them a list of everything that was there. You can quickly create an insurance report. Um, there's also a quick reports inventory and uh, value or condition report, artist catalog. Those are um, some Kind of one-click reports, uh, but primarily I would use the um, either the print pages function or the print table function. Um, I actually didn't mention print labels, but this is another one that I found personally very handy. Um, uh, for your uh, labels, it's going to default to showing a thumbnail image of the item, the name of the item. Uh, if you're using a number, your uh, object ID number at the museum would appear here as well. But you can also add a QR code to it, just like that. You have to be an authorized user of the account that you're that you're that in order to open up this record. So you have to be, um, you know, a member of the museum team, for instance, with authorized authorization to be able to scan this and open up the record. But to have uh, a label like this that you can stick on the outside of a box that has this basket, you know, carefully wrapped up and put away, and be able to open up the record and and view it and, and uh, edit it if you need to, uh, can be really handy. Um, for things that are flat files, you know. Um, uh, artwork or maps or photographs where there's lots of them in a drawer to be able to have some, a sheet like this just laying on top of all those items in the drawer uh, can be just uh, super, super handy. You know, you get a quick view of what it is, but you can, instead of having to even type in the number, just scan this with your phone or your tablet. Um, it'll open up the record and you can uh, view it or edit it. And again, if you want anything else other than that information, the basic information, you can click on all and add anything else. So, I know you'd asked about reports. This is just going off reports just a little bit there, but 
is another type of printing that, uh, that I think can be really handy. That, that is super handy for uh, organizing. I think even at home too, like you said, with photographs put in boxes, maybe you can you know still use that to know what is in which box, which is really awesome. I um, actually, when I, when I was doing my own cataloging, I actually generated uh, pages and pages of those QR reports and actually was the QR uh, little QR labels and was putting them on things, you know, on the back or underneath things inside of baskets. Just it would also help me keep track of what I'd done and what I hadn't cataloged. Cause my own personal collection, I'm not going to number with a numbering system like you use at the museum, but I wanted to know that I'd already done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, Marcus would like to know um, how well does this catalog archival collections compared to artifact collections? So I don't know if maybe you could just quickly show us um, if you have any items available. Um, archival type of items? Mm -hmm. Is that, I'm, is that the, the question? How does so Yeah. This, um, I'm wondering, Marcus, if you're still here, if you can maybe um, expand on your question a little bit. Like, I, I don't know if maybe he was thinking, um, for example, like journals or maybe letters. Um. Sure. Gosh, I don't know if I have any cataloged in this, in this particular collection here, but I can actually switch over. I'm going to go into my uh, museum demonstration account and show you what an archive um, entry looks like. I'd actually, in, in this museum demo account, I'd actually started to catalog some of my mother's school papers we found. <laughs> so this is a record I actually need to, to, to move over and, and catalog as well in our, in our personal collection. So I thought it was really kind of neat. So here I've got this is cataloged as an archive. I just added a picture of her in here. Um, but this is actually a whole bunch of school papers that we found in, among her things. She, she had this whole set of papers that she'd saved from her high school and early college years. Uh, so this is a list of what all the, you know, the scope and content describing what's, what's there, a list of all the separate uh, uh, papers that she had included. Um, uh, down here, we can go into all kinds of detail about this, you know, specifics. I actually included some specific details about some of those reports because I thought they just sounded really interesting. This is a paper she wrote in 1949 about the Philippine Republic and one in 1950 about relations between the United States and China. I don't, I, I don't know if these topics were assigned to her. I wish I knew, you know. Uh, so anyway, so that's how you can catalog uh, archives as well, archival items uh, as well as objects. So. Uh, we certainly do handle archives. We're actually uh, intending to expand this um, to allow for much more sort of um, the hierarchical kind of level of uh, exploration that you expect in an archival system. So um, we do a pretty good job right now and it's actually going to become much better. Sounds really interesting, actually. <laughs> um, Marcus also would like to know, Marcus responded, he said he's an archivist who primarily handles documents, and he was curious mm -hmm. if you can create and attach finding aids and box lists, for example. Sure, you can attach, I mean, I'd create a PDF and attach that. Uh, if you create the PDF uh, using, I mean, if you're creating your finding aid using something like Word or, um, or Google Docs and then convert that into a PDF, it becomes an, an OCR readable PDF. Um, OCR doesn't, that doesn't, uh, it doesn't work yet in catalog it, but the search engine that we're using will allow for that. So once we've enabled that feature, uh, a full text search will even find text that's within your attached um, uh, PDF documents, so long as they're created with OCR technology. So um, I would encourage you to attach all those records. You can attach, you know, PDFs. Uh, you can also directly attach Word and Excel documents to, the, to your entry. So absolutely. Right. Um, Bobby would like to know if you could tell us a little bit about how you began collecting your personal collection of Native American artwork. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I, I, when I started college, I was going to school at the University of New Mexico. Um, and my first job uh, at college, actually, I started volunteering at the, um, at the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology at University of New Mexico. And um, somehow I, I able to get a job. I, at first I started volunteering, I volunteered for a full semester and then they actually hired me the second semester that I was there um, uh, in a position that was normally reserved for graduate students. And it was on this, uh, an inventory team at the museum. And that was, to this day, that was probably the funnest job I think I've ever had. I mean, the, the, the museum had maybe 100,000 or more uh, accession items and had never gone through a full inventory at that point. So we were actually getting to open up boxes and go into the storage room and look at things that literally hadn't been opened in 40 or 50 years sometimes. And I mean, sometimes it was really sad. You'd open a box and all that's left is the skeletons of the insects that ate whatever was in there, you know. But once in a while you'd find really neat things and then trying to be able to trace those back and connect them back. The numbers gone from it, but trying to trace it back to the, you know, the huge ledger books. Um, the original, you know, ledger books from the 1880s from the museum to, to try and trace it back to when that thing might, you know, which, which entry that might actually be. 
uh, but the museum had a huge collection of Native American baskets. And I was just fascinated by those. I ended up, you know, working with them off and on um, all the while I was at the museum and, and got to be just a real aficionado of, of baskets, the technology and the, the, the creativity and, uh, and the mathematics that goes into creating a basket to me is just, uh, it's just uh, fascinating. So I got more and more interested in baskets and I started collecting baskets at that point. I didn't have, of course, uh, any money, but I started to know what they were. And so I started to realize that, you know, if you go to the right flea markets and the right garage sales, why sometimes you find something. <laughs> so I started collecting, really collecting baskets when I was at college. And, and it was this basket collection that grew ultimately into the need to catalog something to catalog and uh, it developed into the this program catalog. So that's that's my quick history there. Very cool. I was always curious because I remember looking at the uh, cataloging examples that you would send over, and I did notice that there were a lot of baskets. I was like, Where a lot of baskets. <laughs> but that's really cool. Um, so Chris asked another kind of technical question. Um, if he, for example, um, has a cat, an existing catalog with maybe thousands of entries in a database, would that be something that catalog it could help him import? Uh, we can. If you're a private collector, um, you know, there's this import, our import function here, you can't, we won't let you import into all entries. You have to create a new folder to import into. Um, uh, well, let's see, let me just, I'll just open up musical instruments. Let's say I'm going to import into this folder here. Uh, this import function here, well, actually, well, first thing it will do is it'll direct you to our, um, it lets you know that it's still a little bit raw. Import is really a powerful function in Catalyte, uh, but it directs you to our import user guide here. I'm not gonna open that up. Uh, the import function, that import function here is the same function that we use to import museum systems all the time. We're importing, for instance, a program called Past Perfect. It's a really commonly used uh, old uh, museum cataloging system. Um, but we use this function to import that. We used it to import uh, the Cameron Stanford's data out of a, a, a system called Eloquent. Um, it's a very powerful function, but it, it has, um, what do we say? It doesn't have its training wheels uh, or, or there's no guardrails or training wheels yet on that product. So it's a way that you could get yourself into kind of trouble. So we, we want to take a look at your spreadsheet and uh, give you some advice as to how you'd go about importing that. Um, or we can import it for you. We actually charge, I think, a pretty reasonable um, professional services fee if, if, um, if you'd like us to do that for you. Uh, but for the you museum folks that are out there, if you're using Past Perfect, we're actually importing from Past Perfect for free for the time being, um, along with a 60-day free trial period after that. So uh, we want to make sure that you like what you see and then subscribe. Yeah, and I will say Dan um, helped us import our files from our old software, and it was like very clean and perfect. So um, thank you, Dan, for doing that for us. It was very helpful. You're welcome. Um, Adriana has a really great question. She would like to know uh, what are some of the more interesting objects or collections you have seen entered into Catalog It? Oh my gosh. It's, I mean, doing the imports, when I, you know, I work on those imports, I, a lot of times I'm, you know, directly involved with, with the import or at least reviewing the import, in, you know, as the, after the engineers are done with it. And to me, it's just so much fun. I mean, you look at the data sometimes and you're wondering when, when you see an entry, it's like, what in the world is that, you know? Um, we imported the data not too long ago from the uh, Montreal, uh, the Royal Montreal Regiment Museum in, in Quebec, Canada, and that that was really fun. It had a lot of neat, interesting photographs, um, uh, uh, neat objects in there. Uh, another one that we did that was also <laughs> really a lot of fun was the California State Military Museum, uh, because you know once we started importing all their images, you, you start to see images coming in of a helicopter or a tank. I mean. <laughs> Uh, not the average thing you'd see at a, in a museum, you know, a huge kind of a howitzer, but also they had a, a picture of a, some kind of like an, I don't remember what kind of a car, it was like an old Chrysler, and it was inside of a warehouse that was on, on a base, and somehow that old car, which didn't appear to be a military car, became, it, it they inherited it along with whatever all else was in that, uh, in that uh, old warehouse at the base, so uh, interesting things like that. Um, gosh, I mean, I think the photographs are always the most interesting. Photographs are just really a lot of fun. And when you look at them a little bit closer, like this one here, this is actually a postcard, but it's a postcard photograph. Look at this image. It's just, how could you not want to stare at this for a few minutes here? It's these little kids hunting. This guy's got a rabbit. This guy's holding his gun. But look how they're dressed. I mean, it's hard not to get, not to get yourself too captivated by the, by the images. Yeah, so, I mean, when we do imports, you really see just all kinds of things. I mean, I, I've seen at this point, I don't know, thousands and thousands of, of, of interesting, fun images. So I don't even know, I couldn't even tell you where to begin. I mean, there's 
there's just too many. American Bookbinders Museum, seeing some of the, that, the artistry that's on the covers of some of those books are just outstanding. I, mean, I, I recommend you go out to the hub, take a look at American Bookbinders and look through some of those, those book bindings. They're, uh, they're, they're great. So there's too much to look at. <laughs> There definitely is. I've found myself kind of browsing through other museums collections just to see what they have going on on Catalog and Hub. Um, so I think one more final question. Um, if someone is using this for a personal collection, is there a way to catalog a group of items? Um, they use the example, an entire set of dishes into one entry. Sure, there actually is. So let's say I'm gonna go down, let's go down to, I don't really have anything in here that's quite like a set, but let's just say that I had uh, oh, this cooking basket. I mean, this is a kind of a typical Western mode of cooking basket. So let's say I had, I maybe I acquired four of these cooking baskets and they're all almost exactly the same. I can document my first one and then I can come over here to my actions menu and I can click duplicate. And what this will do is it'll create an almost duplicate record. It'll duplicate everything except for the name. You have to give it a, sec a second, a, an additional name. You have to attach a, a, dish, a, a new photo of that second item in the, in the set. But otherwise, everything else in here, at, uh, excuse me, the condition also does not come through. Because even if you're cataloging a set, you know, you might have 12 dishes, but one of them's got a chip out of the, you know, one, one part of them. One of them's got a little crack. And even a full set of dishes out of the same set, uh, if, you look up, if you look carefully at the maker's mark, often there's little distinct differences in a maker's mark, uh, even within a set. So uh, there's certain things you're going to want to uh, uh, make sure you make a note of here. But uh, using that duplicate function will create a, a, a near duplicate uh, record of, of what you've just done. Just give it a name, attach a new photo, and attach your new condition. So that will save you a lot of time there. Yeah, and I think for collections too, um, like we've been able to group things like sets, um, like using the parts fields that you have in there and um, listing, listing, sorry, linked items that way too. So it, it's a pretty robust software. There's lots of ways I think to link pieces of a collection together like that. Um, okay, well, I think that's all we have time for um, today. <laughs> so Dan, thank you so much for giving us this really awesome tour of catalog. And I'm sure a lot of people learned a lot about the software and how to um, catalog some of their own personal collections. So just really quick before we go, um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us tonight. And continuing to support our work at the Cameron Stanford House. Uh, we do rely on the support of our community to make all of our programs, exhibits, and preservation work happen. So thank you for continuing to support us, even though we are uh, closed to the public right now. If you are able, uh, please consider donating to the Cameron Stanford House or perhaps purchasing a membership to show your support. You can find information about that online at www.cshouse.org. And um, also on that website, you'll be able to find information about future events just like this one. So Dan, um, thank you again. And, and one more thing, Dan has allowed us to record tonight's lecture. So if anyone wants to go back and revisit, um, I know we covered a lot today. So you'll be receiving a link tomorrow, I believe, with information on how to access that. But Dan, uh, is there anything else you wanted to add? And maybe you can tell people how to get to the software. I don't know if we really talked about that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate you to come and take a look. Uh, www.catalogit.app uh, is our website. It's right here, uh, catalogit.app, www.catalogit.app. Feel free to take a look. And once again, you can, you're welcome to go there and create a, an account that is fully functional and free for up to 100 entries. So it gives you a nice chance to get in there and play around. And that's every kind of account. If you want to create a museum account, uh, for those of you that are museum professionals, you can do that. And it's a free, fully functional museum account. You can add uh, users to that account. You can do everything you need to do or you, or you want, want to try. Um, uh, but once again, even if you're not using something like Catalog, it, I just highly encourage you to, to, to try and capture those stories. Capture, talk to the people that are still around. Uh, you know, it might be, your, you know, your dad might be, you know, in his prime, but, you know, as you're walking around with him, there's things that he's going to know about things that are in, in his house and, you know, get those little bits of stories. You know, ask him what that is. Where, you know, that thing's been on the shelf your whole life. What is it? Where did it come from? What, why do you still have it, Dad? What's the, what's the meaning of it? You know, capture those stories. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's a perfect way to end this. So thank you, Dan, um, and thank you, everyone else. And if you have any other questions that we didn't get to today, um, you can email me 
um, my email address is on the invite that you got, or not the invite, sorry, the confirmation that you got to this webinar, um, if you want to review that, and it'll also be on your video link tomorrow. So you can email me and I will pass them on to Dan. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you at our next event and we'll hopefully see you at the house soon too. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Have a good night and a good weekend.